Gamer Cast Network. Hey. All right. It's a video game show. It's a video game show. It's not a game show about videos. It's a video game show. Welcome to the Video Game Show, episode number 52, for Sunday, August 26th, 2007. I'm Chad. This week we're going to talk about the newest MMO FPS RPG Borderlands, new gaming mice, and feature some live Penny Arcade Expo coverage. And this week for the roll call, when I say your name, tell me your preferred environment or motif for a first-person shooter. And joining us this evening is... Bob. Almost not quite future. Like, the stuff that happens in 2020 so I can get all the cool night vision and infrared vision that we really don't have yet. But you don't have, like, plasma guns. Yeah, no plasma guns. I know I'm yeah. talking about bullets and high rates of yeah. fire and stuff. Next up on the list is... Ivan. Konnichiwa. Although there's not very many of them, I've always liked the kind of fantasy science fiction type. So what was it last week, the week before, we talked about Hexen and Heretic, or something like Thief. Although Oblivion's kind of more of a role-playing game, it's you know kind of a first-person shooter role-playing game. I like that. That being said, I'm looking forward a lot to both Hellgate London, which kind of has a mix, and also Assassin's Creed. What about you, Chad? There was an old first-person, not old, but relatively old. The kids probably don't know about it. It was called 13. It was kind of an animated cartoon-style first-person shooter. It was modern day, but the way the motif of when you played it, it would look cartoony. Can honestly say I don't remember that. Hey, it starred as the voiceovers uh, David Duchovny and Adam West. Really? Really? Oh, that's when cool. When was this made? Uh, it's, it's called XIII. Oh, I remember that. Okay. Although I will say, one environment I would love to see in a first person shooter is a Candyland kind of world. Where everything is like lots of colors. Because I'm very tired of the post-apocalyptic drab browns. Everything's yeah. brown. Everything's broken. That's one thing I have to say. I was thinking about it the other day when we were talking about Hellgate and everything. I, I forgot to bring this up. One of the differences between an MMO like that and MMO like Lord of the Rings Online or something is I have absolutely no desire to see the other areas of the game. Because I pretty much it's going to be just like ruined cars and like pits of demons. Or like Lord of Rings, I could end up in like in, you know, Rivendale or something. Like, oh, look how pretty. But yeah, there's there's really no motivation to explore. So yeah, I agree. It might be nice to go the other direction and just have candy. Dude, Candyland the FPS? That'd be killer. <laughs> and have it all fully destructible. Like, you know. Yeah, you could siege the other person's base and the other base be out of, made out of gingerbread. And instead of shooting it, you would just walk up and start eating it. And like the other guys would have to shoot you to get you to stop eating the base. <laughs> oh. And the more you eat, the fatter you get. And so the slower you are. <laughs> And you, get, you get, like, the, the sugar <laughs> crash. And you Although I was going to say, though, the in the characters, I would prefer to see actual, just, like, the Gears characters in the Candyland blowing it away. Yeah. M Marines. Marines in Candyland. You'd have little gingerbread men running up. Lollipops and gumdrops! <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, if you're going to do that, make, in these post-apocalyptic worlds, we see total totalitarian Big Brother kind of things. Make it a Candyland totalitarian government. <laughs> You could just have, like, you know, der Fuhrer Candyland guy just, like, standing up there, like, muttering something in German while all the little, like, animal cracker cookies, like, sit there and cheer and, like, whinny. Wunschkleifen, Gundgenschleifen, me! Just, like, armies of frosted monkeys marching forward into the real world to destroy it. <laughs> so we send in a crack team of mercenaries to take out Candyland before it takes out us. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me that would not be a million, million seller right there. That'd be awesome. I'd buy it. Okay, so this is the one-year anniversary of the GamerCast Network and the video game show. And there are some big announcements out there. One in that now there are two more shows on the GamerCast Network, Achievement Junkies and Sarcastic Gamer. So welcome aboard, guys. Yay, welcome. And to go hand-in-hand -hand with this, for the Xbox Live users out there, you can now download from the Marketplace a picture pack containing pictures of mascots and icons for the various members of the GamerCast network. As well as GamerCast network itself. So you can now have your own little satellite radio head guy as your gamer pick. The pack is free to download. There is no points for it. Go download and show off Emilio or your radar head guy. Next topic. 
Last week came out the game for the Xbox 360 and PC called Bioshock, which is being very well received. And for a time, it was impossible to find. For one day. Come on, one day? That's a time. If he can't find it when he goes out to buy it, I mean, that's pretty much the only time that matters, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I went to eight different stores, and none of them had wow. it. Now, Ivan, last week you had said you really weren't too keen on Bioshock. So, what changed your mind? I didn't mean to give the impression that I didn't like it, but I did say that I wasn't especially wowed by it. The reason I went out and bought Bioshock was because I had gone on a bunch of sites. I was looking for a new game to play before Hellgate London comes out. And everywhere you went, it's like 10 out of 10, 5 out of 5, 100%. So I will fully admit that I was peer pressured. So I played the demo one more time and, and I played around with it a little bit more. And I thought, you know, this is kind of cool. And since there's a lack of really anything better, I thought I would buy it. I started playing the full game and, and I absolutely love it now. It is a lot of fun. So I am glad that I did give in to peer pressure. And I picked it up as well, and I am enjoying it very much. As I said last time, I'm a, I was a big fan of the Deus Ex System Shock 2 and all those kind of games. One of the things I like the most is when you upgrade yourself, when you get new abilities, it actually feels substantial. Yeah, so for Bob and the three other people who haven't played, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's like four different things you can upgrade. You can upgrade your kind of magical shooty powers, you can upgrade your weapons, and then there's like two other other kind of personal upgrades you can give yourself. When you upgrade yourself, the upgrades are substantial. But however, that is counterbalanced with the fact that you can't hold all the upgrades at once. You have eight slots, but you only get like two of them. You can go to one of these stations and purchase additional slots to open. My problem was the first part of the game, I probably had four magic abilities that I could use, but I only had two slots. And you can't, you know, swap them in and out whenever you actually have to find one of these vending machine stations. It adds an element to the game. It's not just, oh, I've got six magic powers powers and I slot them all and I can freeze somebody and then shock them and then light them on fire. Perfect example is like in Titan Quest, you have the row at the bottom of where you slot your magic abilities. Imagine you had all of those abilities, but like eight of them were grayed out and you couldn't put anything in there, but you had like 10 spells. Well, now you have to pick which two spells are going to go in those two slots. So now, however, to get more of those slots, you have to, you have to kill small children. Yeah. I heard about that. The big daddies and little sisters, and you can, there's some form of harvesting involved. First off, these little girls have been infected with a parasite. When you harvest them, one way to do it is to kill them. That gives you more stuff to pump you up with. Or you can kill the parasite. The little girl stays alive, but you get less uh, stuff to pump up with. Well, that just seems like a stupid choice then. They didn't want me to take experience points. They shouldn't have put them in the game. <laughs> Highly recommended. It is a first-person shooter. There's no multiplayer. It's kind of slower paced. It's not Halo, but it's a really good game. Sounds like how Max Payne was, though. How it's going to be sweet, and then you're going to finish and never touch it again. It depends on if you're the kind of person that wants to go back and play it again just to... Uh, customize yourself differently. And potentially unlock achievements. A lot of achievements like upgraded weapons to the max ability or upgraded magic to its max ability. And I got the feeling that during this game, for the first playthrough, you're not going to be able to upgrade everything. You're going to have to pick what you like best. Do you like weapons better? Or do you like magic better? So you're almost going to have to play through it more than one time to get all the achievements. One thing I do have to say, though, is it is story-driven, and there is a lot of story, but a lot of it you don't have to engage yourself in. So one of the things is you pick up these, they're essentially like cassette record. They're diaries, and you can choose to play them and listen to more of the background story if you want to, or you can just completely ignore them. So you can completely immerse yourself in the story or just go through the parts that you have to. So the perfect uh, analogy there is if you're Tom, you're probably going to play all the recording things and listen to them. And if you're Chris, you're just going to ignore them all. Next topic. So this last week, there was another major convention going on, which was in Leipzig, Germany. And there were some announcements for some great new gaming mice coming out. And the first one here is by a company called Steel Series, And they are making the Ikari Professional Gaming Mouse. They spent 15 months of research and testing with players from such famed first-person shooter teams as Team 3D, Complexity, Mouse Sports, SK Gaming, and Team NOA. And I've never heard of one of these teams <laughs> in my whole life, although I'm not a professional gamer. Have you guys ever heard of any of those people? Nope. Nope. No, of course not. <laughs> well, I had to check. I had to ask. Now, apparently this mouse supports three styles, which these pros call the swipe, 
Claw and Palm. Sounds like a bad kung fu movie at this point. <laughs> and the weird thing here, it's got an anti-sweat surface coating. Ew. It's not ooh, it's anti-sweat, so it's not going to... Ew, it's still gross. Just because they have to think of putting an anti-sweat... Yeah, ew. <laughs> and this is one of these mice that support the higher uh, uh, DPI settings, dots per inch, so it's more accurate. It can go up to like 4,000 DPI. Okay, so moving on from the Ikari mouse, we have the mouse from Razor. F spit. <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> Why do you hate Razer, might I ask? Because Razer um, is to suck. When I bought my new PC, I had a Microsoft IntelliMouse Explorer. It was an older mouse, you know, several years old, and I, there was something wrong with it. So I, I said, I need to go buy a new mouse. And since I had this honking, fast, nice PC, I thought I would spend a couple bucks and get a decent mouse. So I started off with, like, the Razer copper head or something like that. mouse itself was okay. I could live with it, but the software is just horrendous. It's some kind of crappy Flash-based interface, and it didn't install right the first time from the CD, so I went to Razer's website, downloaded the newest version, installed it, and instead of uninstalling the previous version, I had two instances of this software. When I launched the software, I didn't know which one it was running. Just bought a, a regular, I think it was like a 30 or $40 Microsoft Laser Mouse 6000 or something like that, which it's no frills, it's just a laser mouse. It's got like four buttons, and that's it. And I've been happy with that ever since. Yeah, I was going to add here, I, longest time I had the most intermittent crashes on my main PC. I mean, intermittent in like, I would just start typing in a field in a web browser and it would lock up my computer. I would move the mouse and lock up my computer. And I was like, oh my God, is it is it the memory? Is the CPU shot? I spent two weeks debugging everything, you know, running mem test, running CPU burn-ins. Everything indicated everything was fine. I turned off all my antivirus protection because I was trying to figure out what the hell is going on here. The only thing I hadn't turned off was the crappy Logitech mouse support system, this set point program. And I said, okay, I'll turn that off. Turn it off a week ago. It hasn't crashed once yet. <laughs> wow. Yay for PC systems and gaming and mice. Wow. That's why with the Razer, I didn't mind the hardware. I hated the software. With Microsoft Mice, I love the hardware. I love the feel. I love the features. And the software is insignificant. I'm back to Microsoft or nothing. Well, now, guess what? The Sidewinder brand is coming back from Microsoft. And they're bringing out the Sidewinder mouse. This is going to be a mouse with customizable weights, on-the-fly sensitivity switching, and an LCD screen. And it's 80 bucks, and it's coming out this October. And you can put fishing weights in it. I don't understand that. Why would you want to put weights in your mouth? You know, the only thing I can say to that is I have used mice that are really, really cheap and are really, really light, and they felt flimsy. And when you moved it around, it did feel crappy. I think weight does make a difference, but yeah, I don't understand the adjustable, customizable weight thing. I it would is... um, imagine if I was someone who gamed competitively, I would want the lightest mouse possible, because the last thing you want is inertia to come into play when you're trying to aim at something. Oh, are you going to buy a Sidewinder there, Ivan? No, no, I was going to say, my, I love Microsoft mice. However, the Microsoft Sidewinder mouse looks like like a large chunk of ass and doesn't look like it really offers me anything that I need. So, uh, no, I, I'm going to have to go with the no is uh, on the buying one. Next topic. I'd like to give myself a shattered dream pie for forgetting that we're recording at 630s on Sunday. Awesome. We even called you. Yeah, and I didn't have my phone on me. <laughs> I was sitting there with my dad, and I was helping him. And he goes, aren't you supposed to be recording a show? And I was like, no, we switched that to Sun." Oh, wait. Dad, Today is no. Dad remembers more than you do. <laughs> Keith, since you're joining us, tell me, what is your preferred setting for a first-person shooter? Preferred setting for a first-person shooter. My oh, yeah, preferred setting for a first-person shooter is in my basement with a beer. <laughs> that's, that's my preferred setting. <laughs> um, near future. I guess like shadow run setting. So you are of the Bob mentality then, who also said near future. It's safe to say that I, you know, about eight and a half out of ten things, Bob and I are going to be on the same page. Yeah. Next topic. Okay, Ivan, you have a Wii. Have you ever been disappointed with the fact that there really is no way to have demos for it? I fixed that by not turning it on ever. <laughs> 
really a non-issue at this point. <laughs> okay, say you did turn it on some more. Would you like to see an option out there to get demos for the Wii? Because honestly, Nintendo has been one group that never really puts demos out there for their products. I'll answer that question by giving an example from my other console. So I was never a big demo guy back when pretty much only played PCs. And that's because of the inherent crappiness of PCs and that you have to install it. And then since it's a demo, you're going to want to uninstall it. So I never really did the PC demos that much. With the 360, it, it's kind of cool because you, most of the games have demos available. Were I a big Wii console user? Yes, I think I would miss the fact that I didn't have demos available for some of the games, because it's it's just nice to try something before you buy it, especially when you're plopping down 50 or 60 bucks for these things. Recent issue of Nintendo Power, they had a survey asking about readers' interest in demos for the Wii, and they were asking questions like, would you be interested in getting playable demos of games? What would be your preferred method for receiving the game demo. One option they had was what some PlayStation magazines have and the Xbox magazine has, which is a disc. Or the other option would be, obviously, since the Wii is Wi-Fi enabled, have it go through the download service. However, the Wiis don't really ship with large internal storage. It would have to be a very small demo or they would have to release it on a CD, which kind of alienates people who don't subscribe to the magazine. Nintendo's kind of always been one to do that, though, haven't they? Like, if you aren't subscribed to this, oh well, so sad. Okay, so Keith, Brian has a Wii. Do you think he would like to see demos be available for Wii games? He subscribed to the Game Flicks for specifically that reason. So he could try DS games and Wii games. He loves it. He thinks it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. It's just like renting, but it's a lot cheaper than going up to Blockbuster and renting a game. For the price of, like, a month of game fly you can rent like one game i remember i think keith was there we were having a game day over paladinos we went up to blockbuster yeah. it was like I, eight bucks it's absolutely you get it for a week which is i guess good but i mean come on thing is though for eight bucks you've already just paid a fifth of the game don't they have a service now blockbuster we monthly thing we can have one game out at a time yes just like how uh when netflix came out blockbuster hopped on the netflix bandwagon they hopped on the game flicks thing as well and that is the most efficient way to do it obviously if you subscribe to this thing and play games on a somewhat regular basis and don't mind actually going up there it's a good deal, but the problem is, is you have to go up there. Yeah, that's evil to go out in the real world and actually, you know, interface with people. Yeah, yeah that's I mean, scary. Who wants to do that? Not me. I, 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 I hate people. Me too. I hate you guys. I hate everyone. Bob's not talking because he hates us so much. Hate you. Hate. Next topic. We all know that arcades are big in Japan. They love their arcades. They do love their used panties as well. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> they over there by a company called Atlas. They came out with this arm wrestling game called Arm Spirit. So this actually is a mechanical arm that you wrestle against. And in the game itself, you had uh, 10 levels of opponents to go through. You started out going against a French maid. Next level was a drunken martial arts master, a chihuahua, and you finally ended up with a professional wrestler. From what you're thinking here, you're going against a robotic arm, so y you think it'd be dangerous. Ah, dude, I can totally beat an engine attached to an arm. I mean, <laughs> so we took this Hemi engine out of a... Out of a <laughs> I'm a dodge and we, we glued a plastic arm to it. Apparently, they're recalling it right now because of the 150 machines that are out there, through its usage, three people had their arms broken by it. Oh my god. Wow. <laughs> Just like real arm wrestling. They're going for the authenticness. <laughs> oh, yeah. Haven't you ever seen those videos of the guys who arms just totally gel out? Yeah. Just Over the like, top, man. Over the top. Early World Strongest Man, like in 1986 or something, somebody was arm wrestling, and these two dudes were just like totally just locked in combat for like, you know, a good three minutes straight or something. And all of a sudden, the one dude's arm, like right in the middle of the lower arm, just snapped. <laughs> Just folded, and it was just like, ah! <laughs> I've heard that, that you can get, like, spiral fractures or something, where instead of just, like, oh, a yeah. break in the middle, it actually is, like, the bone breaks on, like, a spiral, which means it Very takes, like, 45 <laughs> years to heal. For some reason, that sounds a bit excessive to me. Hold on, hold on <laughs> one second, one second, and then look up spiral fracture on Wikipedia. But but wait a second first. Oh God! What are you doing? No, you're back. No, we... oh, you have to edit it to say that it takes 45 years to heal. <laughs> right there, 45 years. 
<laughs> See, so. somehow that topic got around from I don't know where it started. Started um, with uh, arm wrestling, yes. <laughs> arm wrestling. And we were going to look at spiral fractures and how someone can't arm wrestle a hemi engine because they're weak. <laughs> I can't wrestle a hemi engine. I like that. That's the talk of a quitter right there. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't raise no quitter. <laughs> the Paladino clan, we're, we're a little different there. Remember Brian dove through that window to catch the Frisbee? We were playing Frisbee out in the uh, the street, and Chris threw it, and it went towards the car. But instead of, you know, letting it bounce off the car, Brian dove through the back window and uh, completely gashed his arm, actually climbed out of the car through the car door, and was like, caught it. Next topic. So we all know Hellgate London is what Bob is calling the MMO FPS RPG. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> time when you had dubbed it that, we had said there really is no other MMO FPS RPG that we know of. Now there is going to be another one. Yay! My favorite genre is increasing. <laughs> Gearbox, who makes the Brothers in Arms World War II game, is developing a new game which they're calling Borderlands. And this is a four-player cooperative first-person shooter. They're saying it is Diablo crossed with Mad Max. For what? platform for right now they're claiming xbox 360 playstation 3 and pc these devs who made the brothers in arms games were like we really like diablo we really like the idea of drop loot random dungeons random areas to go through but we also really like first person shooters so let's try and merge these two where you have customizable weapons you have these cars that you drive around which are like the mad max kind of cars so is it like auto assault where you get to get out of the car from what i've heard of auto assault this sounds like a first person shooter version of auto assault and one of the big things they're touting here is that the weapons are going to be super uber customizable they're claiming over five hundred thousand different kinds of customizations for weapons wow. you're going to have three different types of avatars you can choose from and each of those has their own specific skill tree which you can upgrade in different ways a la diablo you know you have the uh whatever they were the necromancer the forest dude Amazon. <laughs> the forest dude always my favorite class <laughs> forest dude <laughs> Keanu Reeves with a bow and like, dude, you're totally not going to defile my lands. Whipping. <laughs> <Fwiping. laughs> Whipping. It's the noise of a bow. It's proven. Whipping. The story itself, if you really care, it's set on some alien world. I guess I'm guessing near future because they're talking normal guns. You know what? If you're going to alien worlds, you're not going to still be using a damn nine millimeter pistol or a shotgun or something you ever seen aliens they had bullets and aliens <laughs> from the way this sounds i don't mean to take away from hellgate from what i'm understanding is not a true first person shooter you don't aim at different parts of the body it's like diablo you just click on the bad guy this one sounds like it has a true first person shooter thing i gotta tell you chad my interests are peak this was just announced so i was gonna say it comes out in you know june of 2015, so I'm really not holding my breath. Well, then I'm going to buy my son a copy and play it a lot. Next topic. In New York City, since July, Time Warner and Roadrunner customers were having problems playing World of Warcraft. You know, bad connections, lagging, and all that kind of stuff. Blizzard was like saying, it's not us. We're not doing anything. It's It must be Time Warner, your ISP. Blizzard claimed that Time Warner had implemented something called packet shaping, kind of like uh, imposing uh, network restrictions on certain packets and that kind of stuff, throttling people's bandwidth. Because of how it's changing the transmission rates, Blizzard was saying, that's screwing up your guys' World of Warcraft playing. Time Warner came back and said, hey, no, no, no we didn't do anything like that. We did no package shipping at all. We did no throttling of you guys. But we will try and resolve your World of Warcraft issues. We're not doing it at all, but we will fix it. So, so they weren't doing anything, but they're going to fix it. But they it. know exactly how to fix it. But they weren't wow. doing anything. What a bunch of great guys. If you can't provide the service, then you can't punish people for using your product too much. Yeah, it's again, if you haven't kept up on this, it comes back to the fact that people are promising these large bandwidth amounts and they really can't deliver it. Right. I mean, because they give these premium and Uber packages and all this nonsense. And so, I mean, that's the one I bought. I have like the retard geek package with everything but a static IP address. And honestly, I've had absolutely no problems and get great speed, but I could very easily see how, you know, they guarantee speeds up to an amount. There's really no minimum that they're guaranteed to maintain. So they could very easily get away with doing something like this with crap without breaking any contracts and insulate themselves from lawsuits. Like World of Warcraft players would take the time to 
sue them, but I'm just saying, in <laughs> theory... You have to stop playing World of Warcraft and leave the yeah. house. I would so sue you if I could do it from the comfort of my chair. If I was playing World of Warcraft and I could just type slash sue, I totally would. <laughs> <laughs> slash sue and a lawyer shows up. Next topic. Okay, on Saturday, August 25th, I checked in with Tom and Phil at the Penny Arcade Expo. This was the second day of the convention. Hey everybody, this is Lemty Fraglot, and I'm here with Phil, and we are checking in from PAX 07 from downtown Seattle, Washington. First of all, I want to say this whole entire event is about really meeting people. It's not about product releases. So we've been walking around, and no one is showing new products, really, uh, because they did that you know, at other conferences. The GCN forum community uh, really came out. Shout out to Obey, to Rothbart, to Altered Weapon, to K7XPS, to White Assassin. And we also we met uh, Liquid Life from over from Uncle Gamer, Feel Good from uh, Gamertag Radio, Godfrey from Gamer Tag Radio and we've just been hanging out and just having a lot of fun and going to the panel discussions and hey guys it's Phil um, we've been seeing all kinds of great stuff great demos games for Windows Sony displays Nintendo displays uh, tabletop games card games uh, you name it we've, uh, we've pretty much seen it what panels have you sat in on who have you heard Actually, we just got out of uh, a panel. Um, it was called uh, New Media, basically talking about blogs and podcasts. On the panel was uh, Gamercast Network's own Godfrey from Gamertag Radio. He got to sit in. And one of the big draws of PAX is people getting together and playing games. So what do they have set up for them there? They have like a handheld lounge where you go in there and you play your DS. But they have open console play area, open PC play area. They have lots of tabletop gaming. Uh, Magic the Gathering, of course, is here. Now, at the uh, PC gaming things, do they have setups there or was it bring your own PC? They do have uh, a bring your own PC, but then they also have a uh, PC setup. Did anyone come to the show in a costume? A lot of people dress up in you know, Final Fantasy. There's a guy dressed up as Link. There's a guy dressed up as Master Chief. So, you know, it's kind of what you'd expect at a video game show. Now, did you get to catch the uh, keynote address by Star Trek Next Generation's own Ensign Crusher or Will Wheaton? Heather and I got to sit in on that, Rothbard as well. He was great. He covered everything from uh, every generation, the Atari 2600, the uh, Commodore 64, everything up to, you know, including the next-gen consoles, and talked about personal experiences. He basically told us, you know, don't be discouraged with, what these, you know, lawyers and, and House of Representative people are telling you about gaming. As long as you're playing responsibly and playing the games with your kids and teaching your kids what's going on. He basically covered some of the ESRB shenanigans with ratings and AO and that kind of stuff. Exactly. Yes, he did. Now, that was when I talked to Tom and Phil on Saturday. Now, joining us live is Tom. So, Tom, how is the final day of PAX? Oh, jeez. Uh, today, everyone's tired. I mean, you you see the faces of, like, Godfrey, and, uh, you know, he's been hustling all weekend, and I've just been pooped, and you can tell the Microsoft people are pooped. You know, we just did a roundtable discussion um, with, like, Ethan Blade and Godfrey, Bill, that was just kind of a, a PAX wrap-up and a continuation of the panel that Godfrey was on. Today, you know, I, I walked around some of the kiosks. I've been, you know, hustling around the last couple of days. I didn't really just take the time to take in the exhibition floor and just see the games that are there. So I actually kind of looked at, you know, Gears 4 on Windows, and it, and it does look really nice. I walked over to the Warhammer people and looked at Warhammer online, and then I walked over to um, Lord of the Rings online, and then I walked back to the Warhammer people because I wanted to make sure they were actually two separate games because when you're looking at the screen, you can't tell. Uh, and then I saw a, a game that Sony was showing, Eye of Judgment, but there was a camera, and you were placing cards down on a map. It looked like a complete gimmick. It just looks like they shoehorned having cards and a camera into the game, something that you nearly could have used the controller for. I walked over to the Wizards of the Coast people. I thought I should spend some time there because they've taken enough money uh, from me uh, during my lifetime, and I thought they, they owed me at least. So I, I wanted to be a podcaster. So I'm like, okay, well, here's the Wizards of the Coast guys, and I like Magic Gathering Online, so let's go talk to them about the next version. They weren't showing 3.0 here. So I, I started the mic. I asked some questions about Magic Gathering Online 3.0. It was like, you know, when can we play it? When can we finally see it? And he's like, oh, it's already an open beta. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the kind of timely coverage you can expect here from the video game show. <laughs> Other games you have seen, have you seen any Hellgate London? Yeah, the Hellgate kiosk was in the Microsoft Games for Windows section. Uh, I spent a lot of time watching people play. Uh, I haven't bellied up to the keyboard yet to actually touch it myself. 
um, because a lot of people are touching it in the time dirty. I, I did talk to um, a guy from Flagship Studio, you know, Mythos team. So I did talk to him about Hellgate and the multiplayer model and Mythos, and um, I have all that on audio, and I, I, and I guess you could expect to hear it on a future episode of the video game show. So any other major things happening tonight? Are you doing anything interesting? Uh, the last two nights, you know, is really great. I got to go to dinner with everybody from forums, but tonight everyone's just pooped, and I think everyone's kind of going home. And I'm about to get on the bus and go back to uh, Casa de Frags a lot and <laughs> upload all my pictures. We have a great picture gallery coming up. Uh, look forward on our forums. I, I do want to give um, major ham sandwiches to Obey for just being on the ball, uh, organizing everybody, having phone numbers. And H. Paladino. Uh, H. Paladino was also on the ball. Just making sure, you know, that we all want to do something that's finding everybody and getting everybody in one location. So ham sandwiches. All right, very good, Tom. Very good, Tom. Go get on your bus. All right, talk Have to you later. A before you go, get kicked out and get kicked out right. <laughs> that was Video Game Show episode number 52, the one year anniversary of the Video Game Show for August 26th, 2007. Any ham sandwiches or shattered dream pies on this momentous occasion? I'd like to give myself one for forgetting that the show was today and getting here late. I like to give Chad a shattered dream pie for putting all this work in over the course of a year, and we still don't get any money. So shattered dream pie, <laughs> and a shattered dream pie to our fans for listening to our yeah <laughs> travel for a year. I I feel sorry for you. We should we should give them lots of ham sandwiches just because they are listening to us. They are our fans. That's true. They they're getting enough problems. They don't need shattered dream pie on top of it. <laughs> I did have a, honestly? It was a crazy dream. We were I was on the street and I was walking and. A building to my right caught on fire. The door frame started to collapse, and I ran underneath it and caught it. And a bunch of little kids were running out behind me. And then I heard someone upstairs, like, crying or something. So I ran up the stairs, and I grabbed a kid. And then for some reason, something exploded, and I had to jump out of uh, a window. And I thought I was going to die, but I landed in a truck full of ham. <laughs> it was like a truck full of like ham, Always and I was, I, was, the day. <laughs> I was saved because I landed in a truck full of ham in my dream. Ham saved the day. Ham sandwich is the ham. <laughs> <laughs> I give ham sandwich a, a ham sandwich. <laughs> ham sandwiches to our new shows. Ah, yes. Ham sandwiches to Achievement Junkie and Sarcastic Gamer for joining the GamerCast Network. A ham sandwich to the nice people at Microsoft for doing our gamer picks of the GamerCast Network. So Chris Palladino, who headed up a lot of that, ham sandwich to him for getting that for our fans. So they now can have their free little picks of Emilio and all of the rest of the GamerCast Network shows mascots. Finally, send your comments, questions, queries, or concerns to the mailbag at its new address, mailbag at videogameshow.org. Again, the new address is mailbag at videogameshow.org or call us at 320-300-GAME, that is a standard long distance call and all normal fees apply, or Skype us at Video Game Show. And I guess that's a wrap. Good night, everybody. We've got Will Wheaton. <laughs> Wait, 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 wait. Say Will. Will Wheaton. <laughs> Say Will. Will Wheaton. <laughs> Say Whip. Whip. <laughs> what the hell is that from? <laughs> from Family Guy. Is it? <laughs> you, you, know, you know You know what this would be good with? With some cool whip. Whoa, whoa, what did you say? <laughs> cool whip. Whoa. Say whip. Whip. No, say cool whip. Cool whip. <laughs> Where is that? Where's that H? What 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 is that? <laughs>